from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carolyn Brown. I direct the Office of Scholarly Programs in the John W. Kluge Center here at the library. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you uh, this afternoon for a presentation by James Reston, Jr., entitled History in the Movies, An Historian Writes a Screenplay. Uh, this event is sponsored by the John W. Kluge Center, which was established uh, through a generous donation of John W. Kluge. Um, who was inspired by the Librarian of Congress, uh, James Billington, in his vision of creating a place where the nation's leaders might have an opportunity to tap into the wisdom of mature scholars so that their judgment and knowledge might bring fresh perspectives to government. The center would provide a place where the world of affairs and the world of ideas could meet, where the thinkers and doers could on occasion come together for mutually enriching conversation. It doesn't happen a great deal of the time, but sometimes when it happens, really, it's truly magnificent. I've been privileged to hear some of these conversations. Um, the uh, f further idea was that these highly accomplished scholars would be part of a larger community that would include the most promising rising junior scholars um, who maybe 25 years from now, when I'm not around, we'll be back as senior scholars. Um, but all would come together um, and, as a community, do research in the collections and the databases, um, working with the library's curators and specialists. So that's the founding vision that guides us. The Center further uh, promotes schol scholarship through lectures such as this, small conferences, seminars, et cetera. If you're interested in being part of the ongoing conversations here, you can go to the Kluge Center's webpage, just the front of the library's webpage, the right-hand side, it'll say Kluge Center. Um, go into the Kluge Center page, and at the bottom of the page, you can sign up for email alerts. Today's presentation uh, addresses a very interesting subject of what happens when the work of the historian with all of its detail and nuance, I know there are many historians in the audience, gets compressed into a drama, which as we know is a very different medium, um, and a drama that has to capture and hold the attention of the audience. Our speaker, James Reston, has a great deal of experience with this sometimes gut-wrenching process. Of his 15 books, three have become plays and three screenplays, which is quite a record, actually. Um, and these transformations have not always been to his satisfaction. Uh, so when he was asked to write a screenplay based on his own 2005 book, Dogs of, Col of God, Columbus, the Inquisition, and the Defeat of the Moors, um, he says he leapt at the chance to resolve and control the historian-dramatist tension. Um, as a distinguished visiting scholar then in the Kluge Center, Reston has been turning this book into a screenplay which is tentatively titled The Last Sultan of Granada. Reston has a number of other books of history, I'll mention a few of them. Defenders of the Faith, Christianity, and Islam Battle for the Soul of Europe, 1520 to 1536. Warriors of God, Richard the Lionheart and Saladin in the Third Crusade. Galileo, A Life. And The Last Apocalypse, Europe at the Year 1000 AD. Uh, but his qualifications to address this subject go beyond that, if that weren't enough. In 1976-77, Reston was David Frost's Watergate advisor for the famous Frost-Nixon interviews, which were televised and seen by 50, 57 million people worldwide. His memoir of this experience, The Conviction of Richard Nixon, The Untold Story of the Frost-Nixon Interviews, served as the main inspiration for a London play, Frost-Nixon, in which Reston is a major character of the play. And then the Hollywood adapted the play um, for, the, for a movie directed by Ron Howard, and Reston is played by the actor Sam Rockwell. 
So as I was thinking about this, um, I was thinking that as life becomes history and history becomes drama, uh, the sense of order probably increases and the narrative grows simpler and the confusions and chaos of real life probably kind of slip away. Um, but no one is better qualified to address these issues than our speaker, James Reston, who we will now welcome to the platform. First thing to say is that I'm not an expert on history and the movies. But I did want to talk to you today about the relationship between the craft of writing history and the craft of attempting to write a screenplay and how these things can interact. I've long been interested in the way in which literature can affect the writing of uh, history and more recently interested in how the writing of history imaginatively can attract movies. How both exciting and dangerous this nexus can be between uh, history and the movies. How movies can, uh, can treat history for better, for worse. How they can encourage historical interest at the same time bludgeoning history. Um, and how they can implant very false notions about history, given the power of the visual image. And as I found it in the last four months here at the Kluge Center, how difficult it can be to write an entertaining screenplay that is historically accurate. Um, so I've explored these uh, issues in some depth here in the last uh, four months or so. But we have here this interplay of form, of novels, of nonfiction, of biography, of television, movies, plays, radio, and even opera, and how they can relate one to another. I've come to realize that certain material is adapted best in a certain form. Now, a bit of background. I began my career as a novelist and moved to nonfiction as a kind of grounded, practical way to treat my passions and obsessions, perhaps that move from fiction to nonfiction spoke to the insecurity I felt about my own creative power to engage solely in purely imaginative work. But I continued to go back and forth, dabbled in the theater with three plays, once wrote a libretto, which was a very interesting uh, process about how you can have your words be sung. But overall, the main focus has been the presentation of factual material, mainly history, in a novel way. Now, this is sometimes called in the academic world creative nonfiction. And the question I would pose here today is Is creative nonfiction art or is it literature? I believe quite strongly that it is art, the, but a young art that has grown. Um, quite uh, quickly and deeply in the last 30 years or so. It's true that the writer of creative nonfiction is tied to the facts. His creative power may be as great as, an, as a novelist, or may not be as great as the novelist, and there are an awful lot of bad novels out there, as we know. But I would like to think that as this process has begun in my own work, the writing has become more visual. And apparently, uh, that is felt by others um, because, as Carolyn mentioned, um, two of these film, of these books have come to the silver screen. But not always, as Carolyn said also, to my satisfaction. The more visual writing is, the more attractive it is for adaptation, and therefore, the more vulnerable it is to abuse. Because there is this fundamental tension, I think, between history and dramatization. Now, I began down this path uh, in 1976, writing a book about a quite fascinating case in North Carolina, about the case of Joanne Little. Now, Joanne Little was a 19-year-old black girl who was in prison in a town called Washington, North Carolina when deep in the night, a gross, fat jailer 
came in with an ice pick in an attempt to, to, to rape her. And they had a struggle, and Joanne Little got away the ice pick from this man and killed him and then escaped from prison. And so this became this fabulous case that involved four fundamental issues. Civil rights because she was black, women's rights because she was a woman, prisoner's rights because she was a prisoner, and capital punishment because she was charged with first-degree murder of this jailer. How then to tell this story? Uh, I went to the, all these trials, I interviewed a number of the people. One could tell it certainly in a straightforward, just give me the facts, journalistic uh, uh, way. But what I decided was that what I really wanted to do was tell this through a set of narratives from different people as uh, Joanne Little moved from the jail uh, to the uh, town around North Carolina, uh, the little black community in Washington, North Carolina, and on from there. And the form that I used was taken from the uh, wonderful uh, Wilkie Collins mystery called The Moonstone. Now, The Moonstone is a 600-page mystery story. I commend it to you all if you haven't read it about the theft of a jewel, and it starts with the narrative of um, the first person who discovers that the jewel is missing, and then it's narratives along the way. Well, by starting with the sheriff who comes to the, to the jail in, um, uh, in his uh, town of uh, Washington, North Carolina, discovers the body of his jailer, his narrative, and then the person who uh, gets the knock on the door from John Little, and on it goes. This is often referred to as the Rashomon approach to, um, to narrative. And this became uh, a, a book called The Innocence of Joanne Little, which was the first of my books that occasioned very serious uh, interest in Hollywood. Then in November of uh, 1978, an event happened that absolutely riveted me, and that was when a thousand Americans committed mass suicide in Guyana. Um, it fascinated me because it seemed to be an absolute factual realization of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, the charismatic leader in the jungle somewhere who gradually goes mad and um, takes his followers with him. So here was this actual, factual story that realized, um, uh, realized Conrad's vision, vision, and I thought if I treated this as a factual story that I could, in, in a prose fashion, um, in effect certify this vision of Joseph Conrad. So within six days, I went to Jonestown. John. And um, this, um, this became this story, to tell the story of this incredible, incomprehensible event, um, became a kind of obsession for me that started with a um, book, and it became a play, and it became an opera. But perhaps most successfully, as I say, certain material, I think, is best presented in a particular form. It also became an NPR radio documentary. And the reason that uh, it worked so well as a documentary on radio, I think, is that I had, through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, succeeded in freeing up some 800 hours of tape recordings that the Reverend Jim Jones had made in the jungles of uh, Guyana. And it was, the, it was the auditory senses as one listened to this voice in the jungle as he is gradually going mad and working his followers towards the madness of, of suicide that made it so particularly chilling as a radio documentary. So I'll play you a little clip. Well, I, let me say this first, John, before, before I do that. Um, when um, I took this material to, um, 
to National Public Radio. Noah Adams was designated as the, uh, as the narrator. And I wrote the script around these tape recordings um, as, a, as an invention of a, of a participant narrator. That the, that the voice that was going to tell you this story was actually a participant in the events. Um, so it was not, again, a factual journalistic approach to this material, but rather an involved, engaged figure. Because it seemed to me, if you told the story of Jonestown as a, uh, as a flat, journalistic, distanced narrator, that you lost the intensity of the thing. So I invented a thousand and one participant in Jonestown, and that was to be Noah Adams, who was telling the story. He was deeply up uncomfortable with this role, because of course it went against all of his training as an objective journalist. He was meant through this script to, to, uh, to project the intensity of the participant. But this participant narrator uh, form was something that I uh, used first with this radio documentary and came to use elsewhere. So let's hear a clip of this. Consciousness and memory of those who knew what happened in Jonestown. At the end, he would say he was born out of due time, the world not ready for his message. He was too highly evolved. His principles were too pure, his commitment too deep, his love too all-embracing for this time, for this planet consumed as it was with hatred and racism and greed. Segregated institution in America is the church at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. In the most racist institutions are the churches. You can, hear you can listen to the broadcast over and over, all you can through these religious broadcasts. Broadcast. You can hear hate. Over over these religious if you just listen with a close ear, hate. with a scrutinizing hate. mind, you can hear hate all the time, teaching people to hate one another. Perhaps Father was evil decades before. Perhaps he was insincere and cruel and even bestial from the beginning. But it is surely bold and exciting with an animal sexuality. His voice was captivating, his presence commanding, his power was overwhelming. I've got to find out who's willing to think. The truth will set It's only right that I get somebody to be like I am. I want you to be like me. I don't want you to worship me. I want you to be like I am. I want you to become what I am. I want you to enjoy the fearlessness that I have, the courage that I have, the compassion that I have, the love that I have, the all-encompassing mercy that I am. I want you to be what I am and something greater. I want you to give you more than I have. I want you to be greater than I am. And if you don't want to go this route, then go to hell where you want to, but don't bother me. He rose from a silent stage in the early 70s. Okay. Passive time. Was it ethical or appropriate to invent a participant narrator to this? Was that uh, ethical journal journalistically or so? Apparently, uh, it was okay because that radio documentary swept the um, uh, broadcast awards in 1983. Uh, including the, one of the most prestigious of the international uh, uh, broadcast awards called the Pre-Italian. Now, in the, 19, um, uh, in the late in the 1970s, uh, I wrote, read an essay by Virginia Woolf called The Art of Biography. And it's had a profound influence on all my writing ever since that time. She was writing about Leighton Strachey's novels about the Victorians. And in it she said that great biography, the art of biography, is not a biography that tells you all the facts, but it's the biography that gives you creative facts or fertile facts, as she referred to them. And by that she meant facts that elucidate character. Every biographer, uh, biographer and historian 
is faced at the beginning with a blizzard of facts and dates and personages. What to choose, what to exclude, so that the selection, the arrangement, the expression of facts becomes the author's signature. Virginia Woolf wrote in that thing, uh, in that uh, essay, could not biography produce something of the intensity of poetry, something of the excitement of drama, and yet keep also the peculiar virtue that belongs to fact, its suggestive reality, its own proper creativeness. That essay led to a kind of approach on my part to historical writing that had a, a number of steps. First step, of course, was to try to master the material of the, of the story completely. And Take, a, take account of that blizzard of fact, that overwhelming number of, of characters. To take those copious notes, and they are always end up in a very thick binder. And then the step two was to go through that blizzard of fact and, and to identify Virginia Woolf's creative or fertile facts. And once I had done that, then to see how many of those facts could be put together in in a scene to, to build a rich environment for, uh, for portions of the story. Uh, and then the last step would be then to, to link those uh, scenes together, made up of the creative facts, into a narrative. Now this is not history in the normal sense, but what I have called historical literature. In a rough way, one could say, it's not that far from what a screenwriter does when he writes an original screenplay. But the result can be, I think, a unique perspective on history, a unique expression, an artistic product, so that the expression of that historical story is every bit as original as a novelist of vision can be. Wolf also wrote in that essay, by telling us the true facts, by sifting the little from the big and shaping the whole so that we perceive the outline. The biographer does more to stimulate the imagination than any poet or novelist, save the very greatest. Few poets and novelists are capable of that high degree of tension which gives us reality. And almost any biographer, if he respects facts, can give us much more than just another fa uh, fact to add to our collection. He can give us the creative, the fertile fact that suggests and engenders. So when historical writing rises then to the level of art, it must, I think, have full protection, full protection of the law. Now, as um, Many of you know, and Carolyn mentioned, I had a pretty interesting experience in the last three years with this uh, Frost-Nixon uh, project. I'd be happy to gossip about it all day long, but that's what, not what we're doing here. But again, I began in this case personally as a participant, as David Frost Watergate advisor in 1976 and 77. Um, and um, there we are in the Beverly Hills Hotel in 1976 in the planning for these um, interviews. The task here, because I was his Watergate expert, was first to master the vast canon of, of the Watergate literature, which was very vast indeed from the Urban Committee hearings to the special prosecutor's office to the impeachment hearings and so forth. And then to, to, to boil that down into a line of questioning that could have a set outcome, which was to be the acknowledgement of criminality by Richard Nixon for his Watergate crimes. So if we'll s s we went to the set and this extraordinary thing happened, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, the Nixon interviews themselves, um, we have that next slide, John, um, were incredibly successful. They hold, the 
the record to this day of a public affairs television program, the most watched public affairs uh, television program in the history of television, 57 million people. So when I got back to um, my creative writing business at the University of North Carolina after it, I wrote a, um, uh, up a narrative of, of this experience and never published it. Um, but then three years ago, I was contacted by a um, scriptwriter from Britain, Peter Morgan, who said he wanted to write a play, and would I help him? And I thought this was wonderful. I would be glad to help him on such a, such a thing as this. Uh, and I remembered I had written this narrative of my intensely personal experience with the whole thing, rooted around in my uh, papers, and found the thing, and without even reading it, sent it off to, uh, to London. Well, that play went up in a 100-seat um, theater in London, um, and it was an instant hit. It moved on to the uh, West End. Um, in the play, uh, I'm a major character, and that character narrates the whole action of the play. It went on to the movies, and at last, uh, Hollywood did the right thing by um, acquiring the rights to my unpublished manuscript. Uh, and I was cast in the film, or Sam Rockwell was cast in the film as the Jim Reston character. Um, so I was involved in this project from the very beginning, from the first reading of the play at table. And I wanted to use this material for you today as I show the difference between what actually happened in the Nixon interviews and then how Hollywood treated those, but particularly the apology of Richard Nixon, which we had fought so hard to achieve. So let's see Nixon first from the 1977 Nixon interviews. And Suddenly you haven't got much more to say, and half the people around the table were crying. Les Aarons, Illinois, bless him, he was, he was just shaking, sobbing. And uh, I just, just can't stand seeing somebody else cry. And that ended it for me. And I just, well, I must say, I sort of cracked up, started to cry pushed my chair back, and then I blurted it out. And I said, I'm sorry. I just hope I haven't let you, let you down. Well, when I said, I just hope I haven't let you down, that said it all. I have. I let down my friends. I let down the country. I let down our system of government, dreams of all those young people that ought to get into government but will think it's all too corrupt and the rest. Most of all, I let down an opportunity that I would have had for two and a half more years to proceed on a great projects and programs for building a lasting peace, which has been my dream, as you know, from our first interview in 1968, before I had any thought I might even win that year. I didn't tell you I didn't think I might win, but I wasn't sure. Yep, I, I, I let the American people down, and I have to carry that burden with me for the rest of my life. My political life is over. I will never yet, never again, have an opportunity to serve any official position. Maybe I can give a little advice from time to time. And so, I can only say that, in answer to your question, that while technically 
I did not commit a crime, an impeachable offense. These are legalisms. As far as the handling of this matter was concerned, it was so botched up. I made so many bad judgments. The worst ones, mistakes of the heart rather than the head, as I pointed out. But let me say, a man in that top judge, top job, he's got to have a heart. But his head must always rule his heart. Okay, now what I want you to see is how Hollywood treated that apology in the movie of Frost Nixon. What you saw there is, was the end of about, uh, I guess, nine months of planning and working. We never really felt that we could get that from Nixon. And the way in which the apology was um, achieved was through a slow grinding down of uh, Nixon's defenses, of uh, undermining those uh, with uh, arguments as best that we could. And it happened over a period of uh, two days or 48 hours. Well, if you're going to compress that into a Hollywood movie, you don't have that kind of time. So let's see how Hollywood handled it. Ones that were not worthy of a president. Ones that did not meet the standards of excellence that I always dreamed of as a young boy. But if you remember, it was a difficult time. I was caught up in a five front war against a partisan media, a partisan House of Congress, a partisan urban committee. But Yes, I will admit there were times I did not fully meet that responsibility and I was involved in a cover-up, as you call it. And for all those mistakes, I have a very deep regret. No one can know what it's like to resign the presidency. No. If you want me to get down on the floor and grovel, no, never. I still insist they were mistakes of the heart. They were not mistakes of the head, but they were my mistakes. I don't blame anybody. I brought myself down. I gave them a sword. And they stuck it in, and they twisted it with relish. And I guess if I'd been in their place, I'd have done the same thing. And the American people? I let them down. I let down my friend. I let down the country. And worst of all, I let down our system of government and the dreams of all those young people that ought to get into government, but now they think, oh, it's all too corrupt and the rest. Yeah. I let the American people down. And I'm going to have to carry that burden with me for the rest of my life. My political life is over.
You know, the, the first and greatest sin or deception of television is that it simplifies. It diminishes great complex ideas, tranches of, of time, whole careers become reduced to a, to a single snapshot. <laughs> At first I couldn't understand why Bob Zelnick was quite as euphoric as he was after the interviews. Or why John Burke felt moved to strip naked and rush into the ocean to celebrate. But that was, that was before I, I really understood the reductive power of the close-up. Because David had succeeded on that final day in getting for a fleeting moment with no investigative journalist, no state prosecutor, no, no judiciary committee or political enemy had managed to get Richard Nixon's face swollen and ravaged by loneliness, self-loathing and defeat. The rest of the project and its failings would, would not only... I remember very well when uh, we read the play in London at table, which is the first step of any dramatic production, that the original script for Frost Nixon was uh, called for two acts in the theater. And when they got to the end of the second act, Peter Morgan, the, the uh, uh, dramatist, said, we can't do this in two acts. We have to do it in one. It has to be compressed because if you do it in two acts, then people go out in the intermission and they get on their cell phones. And then you have to start emotionally all over in building up to where you were at the end of the first act. And so compression was, was, the, uh, was the issue. I, in turn, was horrified that in the play and also in the movie, the uh, apology of Richard Nixon takes place in seven minutes. And it had taken us 48 hours over two uh, days to grind him down into a posture where he could, uh, he, where he could apologize. So I was arguing for, with Morgan to extend the thing before the, poli uh, be <clears throat> before the apology scene, and he was arguing for cutting and cutting and cutting back because of the attention span of the audience. And there, that particular debate encapsulized that problem between the historian participant and the, um, uh, and the dramatist. Um, I have no complaint, actually, about the compression that finally ended up in, uh, in Frost Nixon, because it had an essence of truth. And uh, you had to just take it at uh, face value. So it did not imp implant, as many movies do about historical events, any false notion, like, say, Oliver Stone had done with the Kennedy assassination and his conspiracy theories. And we also get there with Frank Langella, uh, the performance of a great actor who is try trying not to replicate Nixon, but to create a characterization from the inside out. And so Langella looks nothing like Nixon, and the words are totally different, but it comes from the inside of a great actor, and that was really quite, uh, quite amazing. Now, if Frost Nixon is the positive side of this, uh, there is a negative side, which I had with another project. Now, of course, all of us know that Hollywood is a pool of sharks, right? And ideas are ripped off all over the place. It's almost a cliche of American culture, so we should not really be astonished uh, when it happens, because ideas cannot be copyrighted. But it can also be quite painful. And I thought I would give you a glimpse of another project I was involved with, um, which, uh, uh, which had to do with my book on the Third Crusade of Richard the Lionheart and uh, Saladin. In the making of that um, book, I was very much guided by the principles of Virginia Woolf, the principles of creative fact. I spent a year and a half here at the Library of Con Congress mining the chronicles of the Crusades. And in that mining, I had discovered a highly obscure French knight by the name of Balian Ibelin, who was honorable, 
who um, was a paragon of chivalry, a leader of the most distinguished family of the Latin kingdom, the defender of Jerusalem, and uh, a negotiator with uh, Saladin. 10% of the first 100 pages of Water Warriors of God deals with this very, very obscure character. Uh, that book was published in May of 2001, and after September 11th, it took off uh, commercially. And the rights to that were purchased by quite an uh, estimable character in uh, Hollywood by the name of Mike Medavoy, who has done many, many films over the years, won many Oscars uh, for films such as Platoon and One Fell Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So, um, Mike Medavoy purchased the rights to my third crusade book in the fall of 2001. Um, the date is important, and I actually um, have a letter uh, here that uh, I'm sure you can't really see very well here, but we'll pull it up on the screen, in which Medavoy, once he had the rights, contacted another estimable character in the film business by the name of Ridley Scott um, and suggested to Scott that perhaps they would get into an association uh, on this book. Um, Scott actually rejected that notion of a, uh, a collaboration and said he wanted to do a bit film about the crusade, Crusades, but he would, I think he would, thought he would do a, uh, a film about the First Crusade, not the Third Crusade. So some time passed in all of this, and uh, our script on the Warriors of God was slow in coming. And then in the summer of 2004, I was on my way back from Europe uh, to the United States, picked up the New York Times, read that Ridley Scott's film on the Third Crusade and Saladin was about to be released. Um, I uh, immediately smelled, smelled the fish in all of this, and uh, by hook and by crook, got hold of the, um, the script, and it turned out that the script centered on the figure of Balian of Ibelin, that figure that I had discovered in my own research. And uh, so it seemed to me that this was the time that um, I really ought to think about um, a legal action. Um, of course, if you're a mom and pop's enterprise uh, and you go up against a major studio in Hollywood, you better gird your loins. Uh, because it, um, it was made very clear to me uh, that this was going to be a very difficult process. What, the law, what my lawyers did in the first instance was to make a comparative study of the book and the script. And John, if you'll put on that next. Um, what do we got here? Yeah, now that's, uh, is there, let's see what the next slide is, yeah. Where lawyers in, a, in an action of, of uh, alleged plagiarism or inappropriate uh, adaptation make a comparative study. This is a page out of the legal documents in which they made this very careful um, le uh, thing. And they argued that there was indeed substantial similarity between the book and the script. Um, and when the letter of complaint was made by my lawyers to, uh, to Hollywood, they said these similarities are extremely troubling because Medavoy personally gave Mr. Scott a copy of Warriors of God prior to Scott hiring his screenwriter. And on it went from there. Substantial similarity, that was one issue in the whole thing. But what interested me more in a way as the complainant, we went back to, uh, to Virginia Woolf. Um, and here's how the lawyers in my behalf, as my advocates, and you must view this through that lens, argued the inappropriateness and indeed illegality of this 
uh, taking of my work without license. Uh, I read this to you with a bit of blushing on my part, okay? Mr. Reston reviewed the entire chronicles of the Crusades, both Arab and Christian sides, hundreds of historical texts, scores of reference materials, and other detailed treatises containing disputed accounts of the battles, intrigues, and characters of the Third Crusade. Having completed and analyzed this enormous volume of material, our client carefully and deliberately organized, selected, and arranged the various historical accounts and resources to create a unique, thrilling, and timely work of literature, unlike any other account of the Third Crusade before it. Most significantly, he selected those characters and elements which most dramatically told a compelling story, a feat noted in many of the favorable reviews of the book. Well, this action was brought, and um, it created a pretty big international uh, brouhaha. And ultimately, the Fox people um, responded, of course, as follows. You could actually bring that next slide up there, uh, John. Um, but the important thing that they said is this. Moreover, even if, contrary to our factual investigation, they claimed that uh, the screenwriter had never read the book, and solely for the sake of argument, your client's book had been the source of some of the facts in our screenplay, your client would have no claim. As you know, facts cannot be protected. Thus, the mere use of some facts from your client's book would not be actionable. Finally, the works are not, not substantially similar. In fact, they are completely diff different, and so forth and so on. But I would go back to, uh, to, to the, um, if I can find where I am in all of this, um, to the Virginia Woolf point, that it is not facts per se, but the expression of facts, the arrangement of facts, the tension that an author brings between characters, which if appropriated without license, is against the law. Now, um, I suppose it's possible, if they argued that this screenwriter never read my book, even though he took the project on right at as that book was reaching the number 19 on the Amazon bestseller list. So I suppose it's possible that working out of his garage in LA, rather than at the Library of Congress, he had just happened to be a crusade buff and he had read deeply in the chronicles of the crusade. Do they exist in LA libraries? I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and that he just happened to come upon Ballion of Ibelon, just as I had and had developed uh, an interest in the interplay between Valian and the obscure characters, just as I had. All just a coincidence. Could be technically possible, but I certainly doubt it. So, um, reality started to set in about what is go one goes through if you bring a lawsuit against uh, a major Hollywood studio. You hope, of course, if you have two nickels to rub together, that somebody will be interested in the principle of the protection of creative nonfiction as an art form, um, and that somebody will take your case on, on contingency. Well, I quickly learned that those lawyers that take on cases on contingency, even if they have a noble principle, um, must be assured that they have 80% uh, uh, chance of success, so that so that regardless of the of the rightness or righteousness of the cause, um, you're not likely to get a lawyer to take a case on in contingency unless he or she is absolutely convinced of the success of the thing. So that was one part. If I were to take it on my own, I would have to pay for depositions of all of these people. The, cost was put at something like a quarter of a million dollars. 
If I lost, having put that up, I would have to pay the studio's attorney's fees. And so I decided maybe, after all, I wouldn't pursue this legal action. But one has to recognize that this is really the way it is now, that the law is not on the side of the protection of creative nonfiction. One can hope for a principled producer in Hollywood, but that may be an oxymoron. My final satisfaction in this is only that Kingdom of Heaven is a terrible movie. <laughs> but the final dissatisfaction is that Ridley Scott's theft of my material meant that the story of Richard the Lionheart and Saladin in the Third Crusade will probably never be a, an epic movie. Now this brings me to the experience uh, here at the Kluge Center. I was approached uh, some time ago by a gentleman from the Middle East. Would I write a, a screenplay that came out of my book, Dogs of God? That's a story about the Spain of Christopher Columbus. Uh, and what he wanted to do was to have a screenplay done about the last sultan. Now it's very little appreciated by Americans that Columbus's journey in 1492 could only take place when two other events had to happen. One was that uh, the Moors of the south of Spain, the Islamic south, the victory over them had to be completed. So that Ferdinand and Isabella had to defeat the Islamic south of Spain and take charge of the great Alhambra. That was condition number one. Condition number two had to do with the expulsion of the Jews, which also took place in 1492. And um, so there is this linkage of the Inquisition and the defeat of the Moors to uh, Columbus's ability to persuade the uh, Catholic monarchs to let him go across the ocean. Now, this gentleman, my backer, um, said that these 800 years of, of Spanish history uh, where the Moors had the south of Spain is basically not treated at all in Spanish schools today. That the last sultan is a pathetic, feeble figure who we only know is having the Moors' last sigh as he's finally defeated and he goes over the mountain and he looks back at the Alhambra for the last time. Do you have the Al Alhambra? Uh, and utters the Moor's last sigh. In Spanish education, the glorious 800 years of the Islamic South of Spain is treated uh, as a kind of um, aberration, where the Moors are the outsiders and the invaders and the foreigners. Um, so I was quite interested in this uh, proposition to me. I knew the material was uh, very rich. You had the Alhambra. You had its exquisite inner rooms like the court of uh, the Myrtles. You had locations like Cordoba and Seville and Mal Malaga. You had wonderful palace intrigue within the Moorish uh, 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 leaders there with a wife against a concubine and competition over succession, an overbearing father and a brutal uh, uncle and this placid son, the last uh, sultan. There were the clash of these epic forces, Spanish Christianity versus Spanish Islam and the process that's been widely known as the Spanish reconquest of the south of Spain. You had against uh, my last sultan, Ferdinand, who was the prototype for Machiavelli's uh, The Prince, greedy, brutal, driven. And you had Isabella, his wife, a religious fanatic, counseled by Torquemada, very much behind the Spanish Inquisition. Um, 
So the last of anything in storytelling terms is a kind of a standard affair. But I thought uh, doing a project of 1492 through Arab eyes could be quite, uh, quite original and quite uh, interesting. At last, I would have a chance to control the compression of history into drama. And the challenge of taking on a new form was uh, interesting. I had just finished a novel. I was available. And the best part was that Carolyn Brown and Mary Lou Reeker offered me space at the Kluge Center to do this project. Um, again, I revisited the primary sources that I had, uh, had sunk myself into in the making of Dogs of God here, mastered again those facts as we know them, watched the epic movies that we see, El Cid and Cleopatra and Spartacus, and noted to my despair that all of those great movies had a love interest at the center of it, and I had no love interest. Was it to be a feature film in which you could launch off into the ether of fiction, or would it be a docudrama in which uh, the, the film was, was absolutely tied to the accurate uh, history? I used three scripts as my exemplars. Don? Not that one. <laughs> um, maybe we don't, maybe we don't, yeah, there we go. Um, one was the, um, I, I don't expect you can see all of this, but at, at any rate, to how a, a script from a professional a screenwriter is organized, use the warrior script, the kingdom of heaven, infamous Skrillisk's kingdom of heaven script, and the script of Frost Nixon. You see that? Yeah, and this is Frost Nixon suit. And I found in my research at the Kluge Center, my participant narrator, who was called I Musa Ibn uh, al Gashan, a childhood friend of this last sultan, who was with him through all that palace intrigue, through the internal divisiveness with the father and the uncle, who became a major commander at the final uh, siege of Granada, who was the governor of the city itself, and who disagreed with my last sultan uh, over the surrender of the Alhambra. There I had the intense participant narrator that is always so attractive to me, and there were shades in this formation of the script from the Jim Jones documentary and from the Frost Nixon movie. And I looked at these scripts and I said, this is not so hard. You know, the dialogue is short. The scene description is spare because you have to leave uh, space for the director to, uh, to form the thing and design it into his vision and spaces for silences. We saw Frank Langella's silence there. So it gives full range for the actor's uh, craft. Piece of cake, right? Then the problems started to emerge. Uh, and the tension between the historian and the dramatist entertainer came to the fore. Western sources about Ferdinand and Isabella were deep and rich, whereas the Arab sources on my main character, Boabdil, were scants. Um, there were few creative or fertile facts about this last sultan that I could use to develop the character. Uh, and more important, nothing even in the scant Arab sources that exist presented a positive portrait of this last sultan. So that there was no basis to portray this man as having political and diplomatic skill at the end. This Boabdil was no Saladin or Suleiman the Magnificent. He was known as Boabdil the Unfortunate. <laughs> so my backers, would they want, they wanted a heroic portrait no matter what. Um, and I, the screenwriter, was be, to be the servant of this vision which was not supported by the history. Um, 
Now, I knew from the Frost-Nixon experience that the real stars in the movies are the directors and the actors and the executives behind the production. And writers are easily replaced. There's always an army of fix-it men and script doc doctors who are waiting in the wings to take over the original thing. I could see in this story an underlying tragedy and poignancy, but no heroism. And so I came up quickly to this line between fact and fiction. In the interest of a three-dimensional three portrayal of the last sultan, should I cross the line into fiction? And if so, how far beyond that line? And what uh, beyond and how far beyond that line where the sources tell you nothing? So there is this balance between verifiable fact and imagined qualities if you are making a historical epic. So I'm still working these things out in my mind. This talk is a work about a work in project. But how to make a fast-moving entertainment, this is the question, accurate about the poignancy and yet intellectually honest. So crossing the line into the ether of make-believe was a difficult problem for me. If there was heroism, it was backhanded in the sense that by surrendering the Alhambra, uh, rather than fighting to the death with a certain destruction of this glorious um, um, building in itself, uh, that the glories of Andalus uh, remain today. If you go to, Al, uh, if you go to Granada, thousands visit the Alhambra every day uh, to, uh, to look at these extraordinary rooms and the extraordinary artwork. And then you go down the hill into the city, and there there is a Catholic cathedral, dark and dingy and dirty. And that's where the tombs of Ferdinand and Isabella are. And nobody goes there. Nobody goes to celebrate their great victories over the Islamic South. So I could see tragedy and poignancy in this story, rather than heroism. Um, but uh, was it going to be enough? Well, we shall see. Um, but uh, I go uh, with the humility that the writer in the film is the low man on the totem pole and take heart from the fact that William Faulkner uh, needed the help of two professional scriptwriters in uh, 1946, when he wrote the film The Big Sleep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to questions? Whoops. I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have any. Hi. Hi there. That's loud. Um, I'm working on a historic screenplay as well, and I've spent countless dollars on um, screenplay structure, books, three-act structure, and all that. Did you discover that in your um, reading of the scripts that you studied, or, I mean, is that natural to you as a writer or a fiction writer? before you started working on your scripts? Yes, well, um, certainly there are those e exemplars out there. Um, as I said, I used three in particular because I was involved in three and with very diff different emotional um, relationship to, to all three, but they are all professional scripts. Um, and so the form is not um, very difficult to adapt to at all. Um, it is, uh, you know, generally speaking, a script for a, for a feature film runs about 110 pages. And there is so much left, I think, in a professional script uh, for the range of the actor and the director to, to shape it. Uh, as a result, you know, one can overwrite a script, I think. 
um, because ultimately, if it's going to get made, it needs to have this breathing space for the really, the real creative uh, artists in the whole thing. The script is like a roadmap for the production, and uh, and it's a dynamic piece of uh, of work that uh, that changes daily when it g actually goes into production. It was fascinating for me to to watch all of that, and the scriptwriter is is always there if he needs to write, he or she needs to write a, a overnight, rewrite a scene or, or, or whatever. So I think it's important to, um, to look at um, these ex exemplars, but um, ultimately it's the arc of the story and the interplay of character and uh, the line of action that, um, that is the important thing, and that's yours and yours alone. Yes, ma'am. My training is as a historian, and uh, I'm in the process of polishing a screenplay myself. And I constantly am being told that you never uh, write what you can show. And so I think that's my biggest challenge, is I tend to overwrite and over-describe and add things, uh, which actually can be shown on the screen. It, it's just one of the failings, I think, of a historian trying to be a screenwriter. But I wanted to ask you, in, uh, in the process of making the film, uh, don't you have opportunities to defend your vision or your your wish that it not be changed, or do you have no clout? You know, how does that work out in the process of developing a story? Yes, well, uh, on your first point about showing uh, instead of telling, this of course is, a, is the first principle of all good writing uh, that applies to the writing of fiction and, and to nonfiction and to screenplays. Um, I remember doing a documentary film with a very good uh, uh, British uh, filmmaker many years ago who said to me, when you show a picture of an apple, the script should not say, this is an apple. Um, yes, as to the back and forth of defending a vision, um, it is a collaborative process, of course. Uh, but I think ultimately the difference with film, particularly Hollywood film, is is that it really is the uh, the producer or the producer director who really is going to decide what uh, what has to be changed, and that those those demands are laid down on the scriptwriter, and the scriptwriter uh, is it's incumbent upon the scriptwriter to to uh, make those changes. Yes. That person can uh, can argue and uh, defend a vision in the, of of the whole thing, but there is a certain hierarchy in in the making of film, and uh, that's the way it works. That's fine. Hi, I guess. Uh, sorry, that's loud. A bit of a related question. I'm also trained as a, a historian and. I'm interested in going a step back for a moment from the screenplays to what you've called uh, creative nonfiction. And uh, I certainly struggle as a, a writer of a more traditional academic or monographic kind of history with the problem of narrative, how to make it interesting. We're trained to offer arguments about historical moments as opposed to engaging stories for a more general audience. And I, I can only assume that uh, you have great experience at that. Um, and so then I wonder if you could talk about some of the, the things that influence that kind of writing for you, which I assume then have to go through a further transformation when it becomes a screenplay. Yes. Well, um, I happen to be uh, an advocate of the great man theory of writing history. I'm, um, I know that that is not uh, au courant. 
that uh, what seems to be the fashion now is these great underlying uh, forces of history, economics in particular, that really determine why events are made. That may be true. That may be true. It just doesn't interest me as much. What interests me is the personalization of history and the interplay of character in the making and the shaping of, of events. This comes, of course, from starting as a novelist. That, um, that you, if you finish a work of history, one hopes that it will have uh, the kind of rising action that, um, that novels have, and that way it will grip the reader. That's why always we, we fall back on the personalization of history to hold, hold an, an, an audience's attention. Uh, Carolyn mentioned that I had written a biography of Galileo. Galileo almost ruined me as a biographer <laughs> because it is the perfect trajectory of a great story about a great man where you have this fabulous character at the center. I think he's kind of like a 1960s character. That's why I related to him. He's in your face all the time. He's against authority in every way. Um, and you have this fabulous character who moves towards this first peak of action, which is the turning of that simple act of turning the telescope or the sky glass uh, on the moon and then on the heavens. Um, that utterly changes the world forever. That it undermines the Catholic Church uh, uh, doctrine of a fixed universe. He could prove that the universe was dynamic. That's plenty for a great biography. But it doesn't end there. Then he gets in trouble with the Catholic Church on the fundamental question of the conflict between science and faith. So you have the fabulous character. You go to this event that changes the world and then you have this clash that is utterly eternal between science, science and fact. I don't know of any other story that can ever re replicate, replicate that. Now you could tell the this, this story of, um, of Florence and, and uh, Venice in six, the year 1600 with the economic forces that uh, made uh, Florence or Venice what it was. I don't think it would be half as interesting as the, the human story. So that is just my, my uh, prejudice in the whole thing, to focus on the personal wherever you can, and then apply that principle of, of Virginia Woolf, of the fertile and creative fact, the fact that elucidates character. And then you have a novelistic approach to a factual story. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, in your um, issue with Ridley Scott, could you not or did you employ um, intellectual property rights in that argument, or could you have in order to strengthen your case? Yes, absolutely. The whole panoply of intellectual pro property rights. But the issue was whether or not factual material could be copyrighted. And as you saw in the Fox letter, they argue facts are available to everybody. You cannot copyright fact. And so our argument was that it was the unique author's expression of fact, his choice of characters, his, his uh, focus on the interrelation, and, and that those characters were obscure. Um, so that uh, so that there is a unique treatment of the whole thing and that that should be protected. Um, if I had written a novel, um, in the same situation, I would have been far, far better protect, protected. But that's the, what I've brought to you here today, this experience, that creative nonfiction based upon fact is not protected. And, um, and so this is just the way it is. This is just the, uh, the dangers that we, we face. Now, uh, 
everybody would like to have their books made into movies, wouldn't they? I mean, it's very flattering when that happens, but uh, it can turn into a very ugly experience. Last. What an interesting experience to be asked to do a screenplay treatment of a book that you wrote. Because the first question is t to wonder whether the people who are asking you to do this read the same book that you intended. And the question of the negotiation around the literalism or take what we see to be a, an, an Arab hero and amplify it. And the question of negotiating both around what is it that you think I did? And then second, um, what are we doing here? Is this propaganda? Is this an entertainment? Uh, I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the very tricky negotiation that goes on between um, the terms of the reception of a book you write, understanding that everyone reads a book differently. Well, this is absolutely a profound uh, question and right at the, at the heart of the whole process. Unfortunately, I tend to be rather naive and trusting in my relationships with, uh, on the business level. And uh, the, the Ridley Scott uh, experience, not the only time I've been a victim of my own na naivete. Um, in the perfect world, there is a collaboration here, a trusting and honest and honorable collaboration between the writer and the director and the producer and the actors. And that's the magic of it, isn't it? I mean, that uh, more or less, the writer creates the frame and then these other creative forces move in and it, it changes and evolves into something very different than the writer may have imagined at the, in the first instance. And that's fine, that's magic, that's wonderful. That's why it's, uh, it's such an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary form. Uh, so, um, so when that thing sours, and uh, the, um, uh, the writer and the, the producers get at loggerheads or um, what we think of or what I would think of as dishonorable behavior takes place, then it can, it can, be, uh, it can be very, very upsetting. But I don't, you know, I don't think the writer can insist that the movie must be made just the way that he imagined it because if he was doing that, and he wasn't being practical about the nature of the beast. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.